Am I going to get more dislikes than usual on this video? Maybe. This might be my most loaded topic yet, and I'm going to dive into it the way very few have, both conservatives and lifestyle freedom crowd. And I'm going to make both groups uncomfortable in some way. Maybe. Doesn't matter. My goal is to deepen thinking, and discomfort is a natural byproduct of that. Whatever. Let's do it anyway. By the way, you might be tempted to comment on this very long video without watching much of it, but I still suggest that you do, because my thought process here is not as simple as you might assume. It just makes our discussion more fruitful if you know what I'm talking about instead of making basic conclusions. You might have noticed that I'm wording the term child-free. That's intentional. I replaced it with lifestyle freedom instead, because that's what the subgroup of couples without children emphasize. Yes, there is a burden of caring for children that once eliminated opens the door for other opportunities. But these opportunities come at a cost of eliminating even more burdens, not just children. Those who want to have children but can't do it to very complex circumstances, or those who are aware of the potential consequences of their end result problems on the children they might have, tend to have a very different mindset from the lifestyle freedom crowd. I will address those issues also throughout my video. In short, my view is neither procreate at all cost nor total indifference. It's more about challenging yourself to be someone who is human-oriented. This may or may not include children, but it's certainly not about bragging what a cool life you have, no matter what side of the aisle you're on. The structure of my video goes like this. First, I will comment on some assumptions about life with or without children from both sides. Expect plenty of nuance. These will cover the bulk of my video because some of these topics are heavier than others. After all is said and done, I will then present my own position on what this all means. Nothing that I will say will be frivolous. It's just ideas. Ideas that you can apply in your own life, or you may be applying them already, or you just don't care, whatever. I just want to share my own mind with you and what this life has taught me so far. And so we begin. Okay, wrong. In today's world, you're gonna find all kinds of opinions on this issue. And you may be uncomfortable with the ones that pressure you, but it doesn't mean that these are the only opinions out there. Far from it. Just browse the internet. Explore a different neighborhood. The diversity of thought is huge. 21st century Western world and also East Asia are way past that point. Now, you may come from a culture that still has traditional family values. But it's still that culture, specifically, not society in general. Of course, there is nothing honorable about having children simply because your partner or parents expect you to. Note the word, simply. If your only motivation is an external one, then it's very unlikely that your family life will be a happy one. Modern generation has figured this out very well and resists the process. The more you pressure someone, the less they want to do what you're pressuring them on about. But that applies to a lot of meaningful things in life, like having a spiritual life, being efficient with time and money, not abusing substances, communication skills, etc. There are those who are pressured to do something good and resist. And there are others who understand the foundation behind these things and dedicate their life to it. In other words, the pressure distorts the essence of something meaningful because of the behavior of the agent, but the essence itself still remains if you're willing to open the curtains. Mm -mm. That's not a very realistic expectation, and quite frankly, very utilitarian. I know it seems logical to treat these duties like a transaction of some sort, as in, I took care of you when you were little, now it's time for you to take care of me when I'm frail. The alternatives to living with your children in your twilight years usually comes down to two options. Living alone or with your significant other if they're still around, or in a senior living community. The problem with the former is that towards the end of your life you still need assistance from someone younger to perform some basic functions. 
and a latter option might make you feel lonely and isolated. Obviously, being close to your family members feels more gentle, and it's a good option to hope for if it's practical. But let's not bring children into this world with this expectation like it's a given. Here's why. First, when your children are adults, they might have some circumstances in life that might make it impossible to take care of you. For example, problems with their own children like mental health and special needs. Or it could be living somewhere far away. Or you could have some mental or physical conditions that requires around the clock care, including concerns for your safety. Let's say you're at risk of walking out in front of traffic that might be beyond the limits of their capabilities or stretching it. We can't foresee the future, so let's not look at it through rose-colored glasses. Second, and most importantly, this kind of transactional attitude where you say, I took care of when you were a baby, therefore you must do this, is very harmful to parent-child relationship at all stages of life. Let's not weaponize their past generosity to get them to comply with our requests. As you care for their well-being, without nagging, of course. It's another thing altogether to gaslight them into compliance. Before you know it, they'll resent you for the rest of your life and reject your presence, even when you're old, and ask for care. The truth is, parenthood is a life of constant giving, and it requires us to be selfless for the rest of our existence. That's what I keep reminding myself of every day, especially since one of my children has ASD. I know that my sons will leave the nest one day, and I'll miss them naturally, but it will be up to me to take care of my health so that I'm independent and strong for as long as possible. Perhaps one day I'll hire a maid to help around the house, or I'll enter senior living. And if one of my sons decides to take me in, it will be out of their own goodwill, not because I pressured them to. Resentfulness usually comes from unresolved trauma or limited perception of love. Only a small percentage of the population suffers from real physiological damage that makes it impossible to be a stable caregiver no matter what they do. Other issues can be healed and replaced with a reciprocal mindset. Not to say that this healing is easy, but it's a valuable process. Not just for stability of your own relationships, but for your own mind as well. It's just part of life's journey. As for your resentful parents, if they come from an era where procreating was the norm no matter what, then perhaps they had children before they were ready. Perhaps they didn't heal their pain or change their outlook on life before they jumped onto the bandwagon, and that pain carried on into the way they raised you. So yes, I agree that raising children with love is only possible if your mindset or mental health are in a green or green-yellow zone before you start. It's easier to work these problems through when you don't have any dependence. Whichever obstacles you meet along the way will not hurt many people. There's this wonderful YouTube channel called Crappy Childhood Theory, which is about dealing with childhood trauma, but I also see it as an encyclopedia about trauma in general. Of course, it's all about becoming the balanced inner self and has nothing to do with the readiness to have children. But the way Anna presents the mental processes that people go through towards the sense of normalcy is inspiring. I think one of the big mistakes that people make when they're fully thriving, when they're single or in a partner-only relationship, is that they assume that their solitude is the only thing that will do good for them. Their understanding of happiness is subject to very narrow terms and conditions. But fullness of being can only be accomplished if you can preserve your happiness when presented with some unexpected friction, when not everything in your life is within your control, when you allow yourself to be interrupted, questioned, and then bounce back after being inconvenienced. That's what I call being in a green zone for good. And it's a noble goal to work towards if you're in a green zone when single or in a partner-only relationship. In other words, you can provide quality care for children. It's not the same thing as wanting to, but you can. If you're barely managing even when your life is already simplified, then surely you're not there yet. There's no need to rush or compare. Just keep fighting for your own happiness.
But I don't know if you're afraid that you're going to resent your children because you'll miss out on certain opportunities in life or that they'll take away time from yourself, then that's a shallow outlook on life and not aligned with the reality. Skip to points number 14 and 15 about what I think of these. But for now, let's come back to the deep struggles. True, but mostly flexible. Pets are a financial burden too, but flexible. But back to children. I'll begin by describing my situation. I have three children, one with ASD and the other two are neurotypical. Here's how we budget on general expenses for our family. Take food for example. Almost all of our meals are home cooked and shared. So buy products in bulk, which is value for money. And it's no extra time as far as cooking goes. As for clothes, I'm mostly thrifted for those because I know how mobile and messy the young ones can be. I also post most of the outfits from one boy to the next. The only things I bought new were winter boots, because I know that Canadian winters here require quality footwear. I also saved money on diapers by sticking to reusable cloth ones for daytime and using the disposable ones for nighttime. This way is also more environmentally conscious. As for toys, we have a decent collection of good quality open-ended toys that we don't need to add to anymore. We shuffle them in and out to keep the boys interested in them fresh. But other than that, we provide our children with experiences, not things. Obviously, childcare costs money, but the child tax benefit covers its costs in full and beyond. At least, that's how it works here in Canada and most European countries. The part where we are financially challenged is with our son with autism, and this might be a valid concern for you if you're tight on finances. Children with exceptionalities, whether mental or physical, just aren't rare and require extra support to accomplish their potential, which does cost more money. Even local grant-oriented programs might be in a pinch if the economy in your area started going down the drain, as it has been in Canada for the last two years. The only thing that provides us some relief is a tax benefit for children with disabilities, but that only covers half of the costs. For the rest, we pay out of our own pocket. It doesn't help that the inflation is driving up the costs of these services every six months, so there is that. Lastly, I know that people factor in the cost of college or university as far as our total cost of taking care of a child goes. Honestly, it's becoming more and more clear by the day that most of these programs are overrated as far as job market goes. But in case one of my sons insists on rolling into one, whether it's practical or not, I'll still support his dream. But he still have to pay for it using earned income from his summer job so that he understands the value of money and how to spend it intentionally. It will also help with minimizing the post-secondary debt that so many young adults today struggle with. I'll probably end up chipping some of my own money to help with his education, but it won't be much if we follow this practical system. You see a lot of people in a tight financial situation avoiding having children, and I completely sympathize with them. I also happen to be from lower middle class, and one of the sacrifices I had to make in life with my husband is to delay living in a separate place of our own. We had children first. We are able to save a lot of money by living in my parents' basement. I know that people born in Western countries might find this arrangement embarrassing, but honestly, it's been a blessing in disguise now that we all learned how to make the system work, but more on that in my other video. Soon enough, we'll have a place of our own and an interconnected family to live in it. It's okay to think outside of the box if you have these options, but it's still an option after all. You don't have to live like me. Oh yes, the debate about the human population. The way it looks right now is that the rich and influential hoard and misuse most of the resources, thus manufacturing the environment to make it look like the world population is the problem. It's not evident right now that the resources themselves are scarce, just a lot of mind tricks going on. As for me, I'm not going to comply with all this manipulation. All these governments are cold hearted anyway, They'll never listen to the voices of the people they govern, but I believe that interconnected relationships are important and children are part of the equation. Of course, this manufactured environment constrains people's money and time, 
so they can't be present in their potential children's lives. Obviously, there's no reason to believe that the world will be underpopulated ever. Some ethnic and religious groups will have large families no matter what. And maybe one day they'll displace those groups that don't. And I don't mean it in a condescending way like other conservative-minded critics do. Family-oriented people are lovely, and our town has a lot of these immigrant communities. Their people are warm and thoughtful. I'm just saying that nothing is stopping them from having children and keeping the population growth going. So I mentioned wasteful use of resources, so there is that. Obviously, global tensions, distrust in education at the job market, media and culture that's all over the place, sense of isolation and disconnect amongst people. These are signs of modern instability. As I mentioned in my old video about news addiction, the state of the world has been uncertain for a long time. Maybe the specifics of each era are unique, but there's no need to look at the past through rose-colored glasses. Wars, diseases, slavery, natural disasters, all of these things existed in the past and continue to this day, though in different packages. If you study history well, you'll realize that not a single period passed without a tragedy. We process hardships and anxiety differently these days because we're constantly bombarded with information. That's why we're worried for the future generations because we don't want them to inherit any of this. And then there's the economic uncertainty. There's fear that we're going into recession and can barely sustain ourselves. Even the recessions of the past we don't remember too much. Housing in Canada, for example, both ownership and rental, have been super expensive lately in the past few years. Those who bring children into this world are called selfish because it's sad that they don't care about their children's future down the line, just cuteness while they're little. I believe that having a micro-community within a family, but also being connected to the community at large in real life, not just internet, you know, actually engaging in meaningful projects with people, all of these things are not selfish. Most of us can do either or both of these things if we have the willpower. I mean, it's selfish in a way that it creates positive feelings, but at least these feelings are mutual. If we can create pockets of sunshine, of human connection in this harsh world that tries to pull us apart, kind of in the spirit of Blue Zone communities, then that's some of the strongest activism out there. Of course, children, with all their innocence and warmth, do demand a lot of our care, both physical and emotional. I don't mean that you need to shower them with gifts and money, but you do need to be a stable role model for them, though it's not the same thing as being a perfect parent. Be present and prevent them from serious harm. I believe that this is a fair criterion for raising children well, but sometimes you just have the kind of life where their safety and well-being might be seriously compromised. And I believe that these concerns are valid and caring. Let's start with an obvious one, like having a physical disability, the risk of dropping a baby and also caring for them, and becoming double dependent on the person who is taking care of you. Mental challenges are also varied. Like I said in point number three, having children is not the right challenge for someone who is barely coping without them. Another mental challenge to having children is having a memory disorder. Too many tragedies have happened when a certain safety element was ignored. We know as parents that our schedules are very loaded, but having a disorder like that can cause even more unintended harm. But let's see what else. Oh yes, I already talked about finances. Now, imagine living in a society that is pretty expensive, has a workaholic culture with little work-life balance, and limited support infrastructure for families. South Korea comes to mind, as I learned from a video describing their declining birth rates. It's actually quite scary giving birth to a child, only to realize that you're going to be absent from their lives most of the time in order to work, work, work. And when they grow up, they're going to become slaves themselves to long school hours and work shifts. Obviously, not every country has such an extreme system, but any economic downturn makes people desperate, and sometimes no alternatives exist. For example, I live in my parents' basement, but not everybody has such an option. 
Maybe the parents live far away or the parents do live close by, but they're so invasive that there's no way you can raise a happy family with them. And I don't mean average for lot parents, but actual toxic ones where toxicity is a pattern. So yes, there you have it. Caring reasons for not having children. I wish we talked more about these. Of course not. This video has been mostly about the selfless reasons, the real challenges of life, people in survival mode, whether environmental or emotional. Maybe they're also providing round-the-clock care for other people in need. But if you don't fit any of these profiles, then this chapter is for you. No, I'm not sorry if that sounds harsh. I mean, I might be wrong if you're doing a lot of extensive community work, you know, the kind that allows you to bond with people on a deep level, not just, hi, how are you? But I just don't see the lifestyle freedom crowd promoting much beyond maximizing boundaries and maximizing comfort. So let's talk about this very specific subgroup of couples. I'll start with the positives. These people are very intentional about what they want in life. They can calculate the benefits and setbacks especially when it comes to realms of financial freedom and time management. One of the setbacks of jumping into parenthood without proper intentions is that we become emotionally fragile and wish for our old life to come back instead of welcoming this new stage as an opportunity to grow. These types of insecure, selfish parents are their favorite targets of the lifestyle freedom crowd. The second positive quality of these couples is that they aren't actually lazy. They just want to be in full control of their lives and go for their passions without being interrupted by all these unexpected events that children bring with them. They want to pursue interesting hobbies and learning opportunities, share their knowledge of the skills they're good at, and be cautious with their finances. What they value is growth, but on their own terms. There is this obsession with control that limits emotional growth, another important element of human psyche, along with many others. Though what they're doing is not as obvious at first. First, notice the specifics of their intimate relationships. A partner who accepts them for who they are in every single way. Maybe because the two of them are psychological twins. Notice how most of the relationships are curated to invite mostly smiles and validation. So I'm going to create a new term for these. VIP relationships. For the rest, they feel they need to set boundaries, even with healthy confrontations. I don't mean that they never encounter friction, but their way of dealing with it seems to be on the defensive side. At least that's how they respond to criticism on social media. Only validation seems like a valid form of conversation. That's why they tend to have pets instead of children. Pets are easygoing. They will never teach you how to communicate effectively or how to create a new schedule for rest and work that includes other people. They will never teach you how to expand your criteria for love beyond immediate gratification. Notice how these couples generalize hard work, especially if they're into slow living, being a slave to corporation, being surrounded by the wrong people, and having children all belong to the same category, the category of inconvenience. For a strong rational person, we'll see that these things are not the same in terms of their potential value. It's all about manufacturing a sense of peace instead of creating it within oneself in different sceneries, in different environments. Selfish parents also have the same mentality, except that they project their insecurities louder. Please see points 12 through 15 for more details. It's great, honestly, if you understand the potential of this fulfillment. Somewhere in my mid-twenties, I decided that I wanted to get married and have children because I learned beforehand that in order to love the world, to see it through clear eyes, was to live a life where I actively remind myself of virtues like patience, detachment from negativity, not taking physical strain too seriously, and allowing people to annoy me then bouncing back into my work related to my interests. I know all of this sounds oddly specific, but that's because a good clear mind is one where there's a lot of decluttering and dusting going on, 
kind of like cleaning a house. I used to live under the impression that I need to live in a very specific curated type of environment in order to be happy, only to explore a more powerful, less popular path of cleaning my own mind of poisonous perceptions. Once you start thinking this way, you stop craving all these curated relationships and it can actually get along with people, even when things aren't sailing perfectly. I talked about this a lot in my previous video about being yourself and cooperation. That's why my relationship with my husband is so strong, because we went through these storms together and weathered them, learning a lot about each other in the process and mastering communication. Children are unique agents in bringing meaningful friction into a relationship where two adults can learn to face and solve problems. They're needy but loving, ask honest questions without being toxic. Learn from your behavior more than your words, helping you look at your own reflection more often. That's not to say that every family is good at handling this friction, but that's not because of the friction itself. It's because of the unhealthy mindsets, but also mental challenges. Obviously, the boys themselves are lovely and are growing up to be interesting individuals. The presence is fulfilling on its own, but I also wanted to emphasize the self-growth part of this fulfillment because one day they will leave this nest, but this journey will leave a lasting legacy on me becoming a stronger and wiser person. And of course, there are other types of fulfillment beyond this one. We all have passions that serve individual needs, whether it's fitness goals, having an exciting career, or giving to a community. I just think that this one is too important to discard, and I will explain later why it doesn't trump the other ones. I suppose the act of caring for a young child is a private, intimate one. It's not where you stretch your hand out to the downtrodden or make a difference in the society at large, at least at this point of life. By that logic, it seems that those with more spare time will use it to be charitable or useful, or they have time to dedicate themselves to a career that benefits the society. Please keep in mind that this assumption is anecdotal. Children grow up, they go to school, then you have more free time to pursue other interests. And once we reach this point, it really comes down to choice. And the choice is tax-free, whether you have children or not. How do you spend your time? Yes, you. Especially if you have a lot of flexible time. Extracurriculars. Philanthropy. Creating employment opportunities for others. Self-care. Traveling for leisure. Traveling to bring aid to others in need. Video games, writing books, the list is endless, but the choices are free for the taking. Let's not blame the presence of children on their parents' individual choices, or somehow assume that the lifestyle freedom crowd is somehow the most charitable. Those who want to and have the resources to contribute to the society will. Those who don't want to will keep on doing what they like even if they eliminated all these unwanted challenges. I personally want to be involved in the community one day. Even if I'm short on money, I'm still excited about offering my time to others. No need to brag about my plans, but what I'm trying to say is that my love for children will complement this wish, not replace it. I see this argument brought up a lot from the pro-children types. Personally, I've read a lot of different opinions, and I believe them. Some regret their decision, others don't because of the inertia of their lifestyle. Regret is a subjective feeling, and you can't assume that someone else will have it just because you might. But the value of having children is not in the feelings we might have, but in how deeply we view the world. I've been through all sorts of storms as far as keeping my relationship strong goes, but the basic formula comes down to this. Finding a companion in life is good, but don't settle on someone childish or sadistic. No amount of lifestyle simplicity, for example, without children, will make them more loving. It's up to them to become a better person if they want to. And it's okay to be single if there are no better options. 
If your partner is mostly calm, hardworking, reliable, has a conscience, even though their behavior is not always pitch perfect, then they're more than capable of inviting the level up challenge that is a child. We're used to hearing from movies and anecdotal stories that children, with their neediness and tendency to interrupt, can ruin the romantic relationship of the couple that created them. I made it very clear in point number nine that this is not the case. If your mindset is growth oriented and you welcome imperfection, which is a natural byproduct of life. The presence of children actually invites us to be more creative in attracting one another and loving each other even when we're not available 100% of the time. It's normal to accept each other for being tired sometimes and also normal to train our abilities to bounce back. There needs to be a balance between perfection and a mundane indifference. So yes, it is ongoing work to master closeness, but it's kind of a training relationship muscle, just as fitness is training to maintain your physical form. I read this book recently by Esther Perel called Mating in Captivity. I don't agree with every single point she makes, especially when it comes to creating jealousy, but there's still wisdom in the fact that any committed relationship requires us to practice spontaneous joy, go on dates regularly, and be creative in our play. Yes, at the moment, our children do limit the number of one-on-one -on -one dates that we go on, especially since we don't want to burden grandma too often. But we still go on these from time to time, and we'll go more often as the children get older. But for now, family outings in the nature are still very romantic. People assume that love can only be multiplied after a certain point, and then we become burned out because we've given away too much. We might stop going on outings with friends or become more distance from our partner because we dedicate all our time to a child. Please keep in mind that this is specific to taking care of babies and younger toddlers. Children grow up, they become comfortable in their own space, and thus free up your own. The very least you can do is practice closeness in simple ways with your partner. That's what my previous point was about. As for friends, I realized that every stage of life welcomes a different type of friend. Obviously, I lost contact with a few of them after I became committed to my family, but not all of them. We might not go out very often, but when we do, we can relate to each other naturally. And some of them have children of their own now. I also look forward to becoming involved in my community as my boys get older, which means possibilities for new friendships. Life is good. I think the only type of relationship where having children is going to be a serious burden is if you provide round-the-clock care for someone ill, injured, or disabled. There are obviously physical limits to what you can handle, and you can't ask too much of yourself. It's a delicate issue that I will address on two fronts. One is having the ability to pursue your own dreams and ambitions. Not every woman or man has the desire to settle down. They have solid goals and a certain pattern of doing things that helps them achieve these goals. And any mundane interruption that consists of feeding, crying, and dirty diapers is just so antithetical to it all. That's what you're scared of, right? I think it's wonderful being a person who is passionate about a lot of things. But let's reframe parenthood in a way that doesn't deter you from exploring those other dimensions of yourself. Let's call it a new dimension that is added to those other things. I know that when children are really, really young, they're very needy, and it feels like taking care of them and sleeping is all you ever do. It's okay to take a break from your work for three to four months just to be present in their lives to live slowly and take a pause from all the planning. It's not an absolute stop. If it's just one child, it's only one season. Once you experience it in this frame of mind, then you will add something to yourself, not subtract. Then that season passes and you gradually immerse yourself in the previous demands of self. Maybe it's fitness or taking a course for a work opportunity or pursuing a hobby like photography, anything. That's why I created the Graceful Motherhood series, to help us as mothers understand how we can nourish ourselves and others. At first, it seems like your work is scattered in pieces throughout the day, interrupted, but the flow gradually smooths out as your child grows. 
By the time they're in daycare school, you'll have a portfolio of self-love assembled and ready to tackle in full time. You haven't lost any of it. You just worked at it more slowly once, and that's okay. Another issue with identity is that some people don't feel nurturing with a child, like it doesn't come from their heart. Therefore, they don't want to pretend play being a parent without it feeling authentic. Look, there are things that each individual finds come naturally to them because of their background and experience, and other things that they tend to internalize. For example, I was never into fitness as a teenager, but over time I made it the lifestyle to maintain my muscle tone, and I love being energetic. I'm not playing any role while exercising, I just go for it without overthinking. In reality, all of us are multidimensional and have enough room within us to welcome other dimensions. We don't usually emphasize losing our identity when it comes to good habits in life. But for some reason, when it comes to habits of the heart, all of a sudden it feels like trespassing. Life has taught me that these things are mostly the same. It's becoming a fuller version of yourself, having a growth mindset, if you will. Having a growth mindset when it comes to personality and your relationships is one of the least walked paths because it becomes confused with pretend play. But here's how it's different. Pretend play is when your body does one thing, but your mind still clings to these ideas of who you used to be. Growing, on the other hand, is internalizing quiet when noise interrupts your rhythm. It's when you replace the negative thoughts of someone messing up your life with a plan on how to move forward. It's when you enjoy the solitude of waking up at 6 or 5 a.m. instead of analyzing how tired you are. In the same way, you look at your baby as an individual with potential, and at yourself as an individual with potential too. It's a deep thought process where you learn to love the others and yourself without competing. And that's how you internalize the feeling of being nurturing. It would be nice if more people had this frame of mind. We would have fewer dysfunctional households. A person in my life once told me that having a family with children is an opportunity to have an honest conversation with who you really are, is growing as your real self in all kinds of situations, even ones that are uncomfortable. For example, when you're interrupted, or when your questions about following proper safety guidelines with a baby, which means receiving a healthy dose of critique. Children, especially when they're young and needy, do bring some discomfort, and that's totally normal. Life doesn't have to be pitch perfect. Take it lightly, be creative, Stop overthinking, and that's how you become stronger. You can't acquire emotional strength by shying away from these opportunities. This section of my video flows nicely from the previous one. So let's talk about real peace, not manufactured peace. This was a big topic in my previous video, but just to summarize, we don't need to manufacture our scenery too much in order to feel peace inside. Real peace actually comes from being in touch with your conscience, which I'll describe as this clear vision of the world, the ethereal love that we once had as children. The only difference is that as adults we have to distance ourselves from negative thoughts, which is active work that can be uncomfortable at times, whereas innocent children can feel peace almost effortlessly because they don't overthink. The discomfort eventually turns into the feeling of practice the longer you internalize positivity. That is not to say that you can be peaceful anywhere and anytime. Obviously, some boundaries and conditions need to exist, or else we'll be either burnt out or overstimulated. For example, we might explore the option of living in the countryside or a small town. Maybe it also means stopping clinging to material things or media. Maybe it's finding a career that has more work-life balance. And obviously, it also means that we need to take breaks in order to recharge. But life doesn't have to be simplified to the max, especially when it comes to relationships with people. Let's allow them to be who they are, sometimes kind, sometimes helpful, sometimes tired, and sometimes in a problem-solving mode. If there is a pattern of someone being narcissistic or abusive, that's a problem. But most people are multidimensional. Let's make peace with them and train our emotional muscle not to take any friction to heart. Children are very unique in that sense because they love their parents so deeply 
but still create natural challenges because they're still learning how to regulate their emotions. Let's use this chance to regulate ours as well, to distance ourselves from our patience or total obsession over control. Yes, there might be a little room in your heart for children if you're dealing with mental challenges like trauma and depression. There are other ways of finding true peace without taking care of dependence, but building up your boundaries beyond what is essential would only make you weaker. Find a way that invites some social friction instead. Also, being an introverted or quieter person is actually a perfectly compatible personality trait to have with children. We're so used to these energetic caretakers or entertainers throwing themselves in children's faces like, Hi! Let's go! Can you guess what this is? And conclude that this is too much for us. Like this is the only way to engage a young child. We assume that the little ones need this kind of stimulation, but can't bring ourselves to become Blippies or Mrs. Rachel's because it will drain our batteries. Well, guess what? I'm an introvert. Turns out that if your energy is quiet one, then by sharing it with your children, you will create a more peaceful and calmer household. Yes, the young ones need your attention, but that attention can consist of voiceless affirmation or a loving gaze to signify that you're present. They don't ask you to talk a lot like friends during an outing. It's actually a more intimate and authentic type of social dynamic that's making it perfect for any personality type. While my children are playing, I sometimes sit against the wall writing in a notebook or reading something. I might respond to a conflict or help build something, but for the most part, I'm taking time for myself without removing myself physically, and I'm fine with that. As for tantrum moments, there is this detachment technique you can practice to guard your inner peace without removing yourself physically from a child's presence. For example, last week while I was writing a script for this video, my youngest son was in a lot of pain because his molars were coming out. I would have gone totally insane if not for this technique. I would hug him, play with him, eat food by his side, so I provided maximum comfort, while mentally I was in my own world. Even though he cried from time to time, I didn't allow his emotions to penetrate my own. I sympathized with him, but not empathized, and this process allowed me to contain my own peace, but also share that peace with him. I know that if I went into a panic mode, the fire would keep burning more. Instead, I helped him calm down by remaining quiet myself. I agree that everyone should appreciate their own company and find comfort in solitude. Not everything in life is about social situations. I appreciate my time alone in the early morning or when children are away at school or daycare. But like everything in life, solitude needs balance. That's the whole point of it, to recharge my batteries so I can give more of myself to others later. But what's the point of quietness alone if what you're giving afterwards is so little, so low maintenance? I guess that's why I'm mostly critiquing these wealthy influencers who have a lot of spare time on their hands, but aren't using it to connect to humanity on a deeper level beyond their tiny VIP company. If you're someone who doesn't live like this yet, but see it as an ideal way of life, then you're basically aiming for, for a feel-good vibe, but without the balance in a soul. But it's a challenging dilemma if you're giving all that energy away to a corporate job and feel like you have nothing left for your family. Part of the problem is that most of these jobs are so dehumanizing. They steal your time in exchange for income, but not much else. And when people spend most of their day like this, especially with both partners working, they don't have much time for anything else. They want whatever piece that's left only for themselves. It's really a sad way of life. Small businesses or projects are more likely to be warmer environments or companies that respect work-life balance. If you can get into those, then you can reap the benefits of family life. False. Just attending your choice of worship center, whether church, mosque, or temple, won't make you closer to the spiritual world if your soul is not present there. Babies are cute and their hearts are pure, but some adults are too damaged to feel any compassion for them. Stories of neglect, abuse, even cold-hearted murder show just what parenthood without positive intentions is capable of. And we heard these stories so much, even during the era when having a family with children 
was the approved status quo. It is one of the biggest weaknesses of the procreation argument to suggest that you need children to learn how to be a selfless person. But that's not the whole story. I mean, throughout my video, I pointed out that you need discomfort to learn how to attain stable peace and stable relationships. But these opportunities are like rain for the good soil. If your soil is in poor condition, then no amount of water will turn these seeds into healthy plants. You need to replace the soil first, then water it, and then the transformation happens. I believe there is a lot of false messaging in our society about what being a better person is. For some, it's a tough journey getting to a sense of normalcy, but we're sending conflicting messages about what that normal is. It's all over the place, subjective, and always pushing the gates of transgression. You see more and more people becoming comfortable with the idea that because they're a bad person, therefore not having children saves them from the potential to harm that child. But to emphasize, it's not just that they're realizing that they have this potential, they're comfortable with having the potential to harm. We really have dug ourselves into a hole here, haven't we, if we consider this type of thinking normal. We're in the same mental category as selfish and abusive parents of the past and present, unmotivated to heal. Yes, maybe this process will take forever, maybe your soil will never be ready for the rain, but at least you're expanding your heart to be more inviting to human love. Yes, you'll need to learn to make peace with humans, to be inviting to the relationships where you can grow. Yes, it might be less work on having a child, but it's still work. You control the dose, go to therapy, adjust the scenery a bit to eliminate cruel people, learn from positive role models, instead of wrapping yourself in a comfortable blanket of total subjectivity. But for the sake of your own well-being, be open to growth. There's so much sickness in the world because so many people have become so spiritually passive. People who intentionally don't want children are not a monolith. Some have genuine concerns and struggles. Others are waiting for the right opportunity before they take a leap. And the rest have shallow minds. Shallow because the only thing that is standing between them and this new life is not understanding how human connection works. Yes, human connection. Making room for medium maintenance relationships where there's both affection and friction. Aligning your intentions with challenges to grow, to develop your emotional muscle, to discover that emotional growth can complement your growth in other areas like passions, health, and charity, instead of taking away from them, to become a stable, multidimensional self, to attain real peace, not manufactured peace. The movement of simplifying one's life has made some great points about reducing overstimulation and emphasizing meaningful work over unnecessary stress. But some of its followers made the mistake of lumping being a wage slave with the ambitions of having a family with children, as if the latter has no value beyond keeping you busy. There is actually a difference between the two realms. One is about obedience and order, and the other one is about relationships. Relationship-related work that gives you opportunities to have a bigger heart. Doesn't mean that everyone has a strength or wisdom to handle these opportunities, but they're still real. And when your environment or mental health are not inviting to children, and yet you're working so hard to make it better. The alternatives should also make you a fuller, human-oriented person. Maybe it's community work with the sick or the poor. Maybe it's advocating for better living conditions or putting in the labor to create these communities. Maybe it's creating a device or a supplement that improves health. These are just some ideas off the top of my head. I'm sure there are many more. But the message that I'm trying to get across is that of being of service to the humankind, not just to your pets and partner. I know that caring for children is demanding, so I'm sure there are other ways to connect with people that will feel less restrictive, but should still provide some discomfort, some problem solving, that makes you aware of needs beyond your own. Your needs matter too, but limitless emotional comfort hinders growth, 
when it's too excessive. At the end of the day, why do I care about people's choices? Even after all these elaborate ideas, people will still be free to live their lives as they want, even if it's emotionally simple. I mean, how does it affect me? My answer is that there is this wistful sadness to how people are forgetting what it's like being a close-knit community. In the micro world that is a stable family unit is being replaced with customizable relationships. More and more people retreating into their own corners. I guess on an individual level it's not a big deal, but collectively they're contributing to a fragmented society now that their numbers are bigger than ever. They're changing the macro world where people actually used to interact with one another and work towards a stable system. I know it wasn't always ideal, but there were periods in time where pockets of unity were more visible. Here's how the macro world looks now. There's exploitation on the one hand when it comes to the elite, and lack of connection to one another when it comes to people across different backgrounds. Those who are happy in this system simply manage to climb the ladder really high and are content forgetting about everyone left behind. I don't mean that every single person is cold and isolated, but the pockets of isolation are spreading more and more around our society. Social media praises the trends of living alone or in a tiny VIP style relationships, and more and more people are becoming like that. They use the euphemism of loving one another from a distance, but that's not love if it doesn't extend beyond low maintenance relationships. Is hiding in a castle that they built for themselves and peering at the rest of the world through their tiny window. In addition to people opting out from having children due to serious hardships, we also have the frivolous types who are opting out from both children and other types of human relationships. And so the overall sense of community of interconnected support systems is becoming fragmented. Of course, there are pockets of sunshine that remind me of what quality life in the form of a community looks like. Maybe it's small intimate towns that you pass by while taking a road trip. There are also blue zone regions where people live long lives. I know that most of the talk about these places centers around people's diets, but note the other qualities that they have in common. Close-knit communities that include traditional families, work that is based on sustenance, being close to nature, and yes, even religion and spirituality. You know, actually living by their values, not just preaching. I'm not saying this because I want to compare how long people live, but to observe that quality life consists of these elements because of what they do to our bodies and souls. And if we can apply as many of these to our own lives, then we can create more pockets of sunshine in our pain-ridden world. And the human element is the one that is too precious to abandon. Let's relearn how to connect to one another as our previous generations have. Let's stop looking at a child like a material burden and instead see the value in their presence. And if a serious obstacle is preventing us from providing care to a child, then find a way to cultivate that value by being with other humans who teach us how to love through discomfort. All that so we can love deeply without extremely narrow boundaries. And it's all I have to say for now, which was a lot. Until later.